this is uh, this is over home. Uh, thanks, Becca, very much for those kind words. And Dean Rutherford for inviting me here uh, to be back at the Clinton School. It's wonderful. Uh, Nikolai, for all of your kind assistance. Uh, I can't be in Sturgis Hall, though, without, I can't call the roll here. I see too many people I care too much about. And I, I could go the whole hour just on the faces I see here and all of the memories. So just know that I thank you all, and it means a lot to me that you're here. I can't be in this room without remembering a time four years ago when President Clinton was here and he presented the first Lee Williams Fellowship in Public Service to Molly Mary. And the president warmly recalled all that Lee had meant to him as a mentor and as a friend and that he's meant to all of us. And uh, Mark Leonard is here today as a recipient of the Lee Williams Fellowship. And, uh, Lee asked me, Mark, to give you his warmest wishes and to those of your fellow students. Thank you. Uh, another reason it's special for me to be home, our family, my brother Bev and my cousins Mary and Bill Reynolds, our family settled in Arkansas in 1839. This has been home for us for 171 years. And uh, while I've been away for a long time, I have a lot of pride in my roots. And this will always be my home. And it's just great, great to be with you. Another reason, of course, President Clinton appointed me to Rome. I was at the U.S. Mission as counselor to the U.S. Mission to the Hunger Agencies of the U.N. That's the World Food Program and the EFAD and FAO. And its mission, it's the cutting edge institution for the U.S. government with an objective to end hunger and poverty in the world. I'd been there not too long. David Pryor called me and he said, you know, I've been thinking. I think you have the best job in the entire government. I said, well, when you look at the issues I'm able to work with, the beneficiaries I can serve in the developing world, and to be able to work around great hunger champions like Catherine Bertini of the World Food Program and George McGovern and Tony Hall, I do have the best job in government, and I am blessed. Um, I got a very quick education on who makes U.S. policy right after I got to Rome. I don't tell this to get our government people in a squabble with each other. I just tell it as a funny story. But I'd been there about a week. I went over to the FAO for a meeting. It was on the right to food. And I knew the U.S. was a signer of the U.N. Declaration of the Right to Food. So good meeting. I came back to the mission. I said to our DCM, I guess we're okay on that. She said, no, no, that's not our position. We need to call our lawyers in the State Department. So I called the lawyers in the State Department. I said, do we believe in a right to food? He said, no, no. I said, well, wh what do we believe in? We believe in a right to access to food. I said, well, what's the difference? Well, we think somewhere in some foreign country, some tribunal someday might sue us if they're hungry. So we try to be generous, but I said, that sounds pretty legalistic, but I'm on message. No right to food. So about two weeks later, I have the monitor on in my office and Larry King, is interviewing Bill Clinton, President Clinton. He says, Mr. President, does the United States believe in a right to food? Clinton said, absolutely we do. <laughs> he said, it's our soul, our core values. It goes to the heart of who we are as a people. Of course we believe in the right to food. So I called the lawyer back at the State Department. <laughs> I said, uh, I want to share with you what the head of our government has just told 18 million people. He said, you know, I wouldn't worry about that. The president didn't realize what he was saying. That's not our position. I said, I'm really glad I could clear that up. There's a third reason that it's so special to be here, and that is, I believe by any critical analysis, this state has done more has made a more enduring mark on our quest to end hunger in the world than any other place in America. And I'm going to tell you the reasons. Now, I may get some pushback from Seattle, the home of the Gates Foundation, and their, their work they're doing with the Alliance for the Green Revolution. Wonderful work. Our Des Moines, which has the World Food Prize, and Iowa State next door, and I'm privileged to be a fellow there. They do marvelous work in 30 African countries. 
But if you look at the long-term total impact influence around the world, the leaders and the institutions identified with this state have done more than anyone. And I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to save Heifer for last. First, I don't need to say much about this, the presidential legacy and post-presidential legacy of Bill Clinton. I mean, there's a library over here brimming with the glorious legacy of his international development programs and what they have meant transforming the lives of people. The work of the Clinton Foundation. I mean, it is awesome work. It's hard to imagine its impact. It covers a lot of ground, but its impact on food security is particularly significant. And I would just cite uh, child, child nutrition and obesity, the work they're doing in crop improvement, HIV AIDS. Why is that a food security issue? Well, because the UN says that in the last 25 years, more than 8 million farmers have died of AIDS. They calculate that to be 16 million years of human labor producing food. That's just one of the reasons why AIDS is such a critical key part of this equation. Climate change, Clinton Foundation work. Global Crop Diversity Trust says that in the next, uh, the main staple in Africa is white maize. And in Asia, it's rice and wheat. It's white corn in Africa. 300 million Africans rely on white maize as their staple. The trust predicts that under current conditions with climate change, the yields on white maize will drop 30% in the next 20 years. Another reason, Clinton School of Public Service and all the wonderful things it's doing. I'm going to talk more about that. Another reason, Winrock International. From Arkansas Roots, a global mission. Some of you were here two weeks ago. Bill Clinton gave a powerful testimonial. That not only is Governor Rockefeller's legacy transforming lives around the world, it is a model for the other NGOs. It's implemented more than a billion dollars worth of projects in 60 countries. Let me just say that the work of Winrock is not the most exciting. It's quite simply the most valuable. They go to the most forsaken places on the planet and they find the people who most need their help and they empower women, they improve the yields on crops, they protect nature. It's a gold standard for NGOs. The governor's leadership, and I'd like to especially thank my good friend Governor Tucker for being here. The work from his day on, the work of the governor's offices, Governor Beebe's office today, their exceptional collaboration with the Arkansas Hunger Relief Alliance, the food bank networks, Share Our Strength, and all of those partnerships, the Rice Depot, our congressional delegation. Senator Lincoln is, in fact, the founder of the U.S. Senate Hunger Caucus. <coughs> nationally recognized leader in nutrition and obesity. Senator Pryor is a strong partner and especially on appropriation, appropriation levels for nutrition. I'm not through. We remember 18 years that David Pryor was on the Agriculture Committee and had a key leadership role in modernizing food stamp, WIC, and the school, the school lunch program. Our own J. William Fulbright, at the time of Fulbright's death in 1995, there had been 250,000 Fulbright scholars over a span of 50 years. Imagine what that has meant to international policy development in parliaments around the world. And on top of that, it was Fulbright's legislation that led to the U.S. presence in the United Nations, which in turn spawned the World Food Program, the International Fund for Ag Development, in the Food and Agriculture Organization. And I can't be here without mentioning our Secretary of State. She will tell you her top priority today is Feed the Future. It's a global food security initiative. And she's told friends part of her inspiration came when she was the First Lady of Arkansas working with poor and hungry children right here. There's more. Carl Wheelock, Margaret, thank you. 
Some of you may know the McGovern Dole uh, International Food for Education Child Nutrition Act. If you don't, just, ima just imagine our school lunch program overseas. That's what it is. And all of the benefits, better attendance, better performance, stronger families, um, stronger national defense, better job markets, all the rest of it. President Clinton will be the first to tell you that if it had not been for Carl Wheelock, there never would have been a McGovern Dole program. And what is its significance today? Today, that program has served 23 million children in 41 countries. Josette Sheeran calls it the most effective human rights program for girls ever conceived. I talked last week with George McGovern. He got very animated talking about Carl. He said, you know, if history were fair, it really would be remembered as the McGovern Dole Wheelock program. And that's true. University of Arkansas Ag Division, all they're doing, the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, the National Ag Law Center, our land grant university is doing phenomenal things on global food security. Our corporations, I mean, I don't need to tell you what the Walmarts, the Tysons, their generosity both with their funds, Walmart's $2 billion commitment the other day, all they do working with the governor's office with Share Our Strength. Our agriculture, half the nation's rice, second or third in poultry, cotton, aquaculture. But more to my point, they've been a key supplier when there are crises around the world on export bans. They are there as a key supplier. If there's a crisis in Haiti, they are a key supplier. We have a lot of heart. We not only have a lot of resources, we have a lot of heart. And now Heifer. Imagine 75 years ago when someone had the, had the glorious epiphany to understand how critically important it was to have animal source protein in a child's diet on a regular basis. Well, Joe Luck has just won the World Food Prize, so the rest is history. As Bill Clinton would say, this is a huge deal. This is the United States equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize. It goes to the person in the world who has done the most through hunger and agricultural science to end global hunger. So these are the monumental and I think unparalleled contributions that this state has made and continues to make for a safer and more well-fed world. It's impressive, but we know we have a paradox here at home and we still have a lot to do. But who should be in this fight? We all should. And we know why I can be brief on this part. We know it's a moral issue. We know it's a faith issue. We know it's an it's, uh, economics and trade issue. We know we want stronger partners. Poor people don't make good customers. We found out after the food crisis of 2008, it's a national security issue big time and you have riots in 35 countries and governments being overthrown. So now for the first time at the table in Washington, you don't just have USAID and, and USDA. You've got USTR and you've got the State Department and you've got the National Security Council, the White House, and you have the Department of Defense. We are all in this together. So where are we now? Just a quick snapshot of where we are and where we need to go. We've got a paradox at home. We've got some numbers we don't like. Highest incidence of child hunger, 400,000 Arkansans without enough to eat, 240,000 on free school lunch. 16% of our households food insecure. But we have a lot of wonderful people and institutions working hard on this, and we're going to do something about it just as we've done overseas. We're going to, we're going to be change agents. But even though we're hurting a lot, these numbers are not dramatically different according to FRAC. They're not dramatically different from Nebraska or Colorado or Indiana. They're just a little worse, but they can get a lot better. Nationally, 
49 million people, one in seven households food insecure, 39 million on food stamps. Incidentally, Sodexo, when people think this is just a, a do-gooder issue, uh, the economist at Harvard, Brandeis and Loyola did a hard-nosed economic study on the cost of hunger in America to Americans. Forget overseas for the moment. $90 billion a year. Malnutrition, hospitalizations, lost job opportunities, diminished outcomes in education, cost to charities, all of it. That's what we're giving up by allowing this condition to exist. When we go overseas, it's even more daunting. A billion people, 25,000 a day, a child every five seconds. One in three children in the world is malnourished. 90% of child hunger is chronic. It's not, it's not dramatic in a hurricane or a flood. They just curl up in a fetal position and they're gone. That's chronic hunger as opposed to acute hunger. And we know that 180 million children, according to the UN, are stunted, will never have a normal life. That's half the population of the United States. So what do we do? How do we respond? We know if we're going to respond to get hold of it, these issues are all connected. None of them are separate. HIV AIDS is linked to nutrition. That's linked to food production. That's linked to climate change. That's linked to new technologies. So you have to consider them all at one time. We know the root causes from government policies to poverty to trade barriers. Policy answers, democracy building, trade liberalization, debt relief, and so on. But I want to just, I want to highlight a few that I think, a handful, that I think are the most important. And I do that because these are issues that either are not getting the attention they deserve or because they're misunderstood, one or the other. First is population. I talked to a longtime friend as a diplomat. I said, I need to talk about population at the Clinton School. He said, oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I said, why not? He said, it's just too controversial. You need to stay away from it. I said, well, I, I trained under J. William Fulbright, and he taught us to challenge everything, to think the unthinkable. He, if, it's, if it's a problem, it should be dealt with. You don't walk away from it. And that's one of the reasons. The reason we know it's the overriding issue is every conference on food security begins this way. We're now six billion people, we're going to nine billion by 2050, something like that. And then they go on to something else. Compounding that, as I mentioned, we've got to double food production by 2050. In other words, in another 40 years, we've been around a long time, in another 40 years we've got to double the same land got to double the amount of food we produce. And if that's not bad enough, in sub-Saharan Africa, as I mentioned because of climate change, the white maize yields are going to drop 30 percent. So it's a ticking time bomb. But these aren't my words. These are the words of Gabeza Ejeta. Dr. Ejeta is the great ag scientist from Purdue, and he is Joe Luck's predecessor. He was standing at the podium last year in Des Moines, where she will stand next month. And he made that statement. He grew up in a one-room hut in Ethiopia. He knows something about this, these issues and the conditions. Jeffrey Sachs, who's been here a number of times, said we are on an absolutely unsustainable population path. And Norman Borlaug, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 was even more ominous. <clears throat> but let me, uh, let me just give some examples of why this needs to concern us. In 1900, we were 1.6 billion people. In the year 2000, flip that, we were 6.1. We grow by a rate of 80 million people a year on this planet. So from the time President Obama took office to the end of this term, in four years, we will have grown 320 million people. Uganda, 
is a small country in East Africa about the size of Oregon, twice the size of Arkansas physically. It has 32 million people. Population Reference Bureau predicts it will be 96 billion by 2050, it will triple. Ethiopia, in all of human history, Ethiopia reached 10 million people by the time of the beginning of World War II. 10, and it looks like that. It's now 80 and growing very fast. It then had 50% forest cover, it now has 3%. The droughts are more extensive, uh, the hunger is more intense, and the population is surging. So this raises a rather profound question, at what population level is this planet no longer sustainable? Well, you can't answer that without answering what's going to happen with all of the good things that Heifer's doing and that Winrock's doing and what are we going to do about plant pest and what are we going to do about drought and what are we going to do about governments. So I'm not going to get into questions of uh, concerns of conscience or religious or ethical aspects of this. The reality is that most of the best policy answers are not controversial, they just have not been addressed particularly international development, including agricultural development. We have allowed our agricultural development in the last 25 years. It, you say, for example, the percent of our global development that we spent on agriculture, it dropped from 25% to 1%. World Bank, 30 to 8. It's all going up a little now because people are afraid. They got afraid after the 2008 crisis and said, we were not taking care of business. So that's one of the most important things. Education, education with nutrition. George McGovern widely cites UN data that girls who have had the benefit of school lunch with education have 2.9 births. Without that, 6.1. One of the most effective ways and one of the most appealing ways to deal with this issue. Another is governance. The second issue, we can talk about all of the others. The main root cause of hunger is governance. Any way you cut it, because it's the root cause of most everything else, whether it's famine, civil wars, AIDS, nutrition policy, all of the other problems that we have come from governance. It's at the core. If you don't believe it, look at examples like, look at Zimbabwe and North Korea. DRK, Somalia, and see how despotic regimes can disempower their people with stunning implications for health and food security. And we know that governance is the key. That's why the Millennium Challenge Corporation is such a very good idea on having accountability in our partnerships, on insisting on good governance and investing in people and good economic policies. Another issue, this issue, if this issue had gotten as much action as it has lip service, it would be solved. Empowerment of women. Every speaker talks about it. I mean, there's not a speech, you can go to the UN archives, there's not a speech that doesn't talk about the importance of empowering women. And yet the reality is, we think today, uh, the data is not very good. Probably in sub-Saharan Africa, of all farmers, 85% of women are women. In India, it's probably 65. In Latin America, it's over 50. This should be unacceptable to every policy leader. We, we, these policies are made by men for men, and that's not the reality of the place. Women have all of the important roles in the home, but they have none of the economic levers of power or bank credit or office holding. And we know that if they're not in the political arena, you're not gonna deal with issues like safe drinking water and education and child safety. I mean, it's a real paradox to talk about a democracy without the participation of women, and yet in so many countries around the world, that's what we have. Related to that, young girls, the most discriminated against subset in all of humanity are young girls. They stay home with the livestock.
While their brothers go to school, they're more malnourished. They have children earlier, they're more vulnerable to disease. They have less control of their futures. And they're often forced into riskier professions. And, and on that point, I would just say in passing, I, I, not my purpose to talk about sex trafficking, but we should remember that of the nearly seven million women and girls today who are in forced prostitution and forced labor, to some extent, it is a consequence of food insecurity. Another issue, early child nutrition. It's the linchpin of everything we do in our Millennium Development Goals. All of our foreign policy objectives mean very little if we don't get this part right. If we don't deal with those minus nine to 24 months, it's irreversible. And yet we spend boatloads of money around the world on everything else we can think of, and we're trying to take care of that little life, that little wasted, stunted life that we haven't taken care of in the early years, wondering why does it cost us so much on international development? Why can't we get it right? 180 million children stunted. Height for age is the greatest single predictor of human capital. And we still don't understand that. I, I just have to say a word about obesity because it's relevant to this. Um, there's a malnutrition issue in the United States. Um, obesity is by far the most urgent. It eclipses undernutrition. It's our number one public health problem. It's either the principal cause or a leading risk factor for type 2 diabetes, for hypertension, cancer. It, will, it has tripled in our children in a generation. Our youngest generation today will live five to seven years shorter if they are obese. This will be the first generation in our 12 generations in which they will live a shorter lifespan than their parents, largely because of this disease. Who's to blame? All of us. No exceptions. Parents, the medical fraternity, academia, governments, the food industry. But I think rather than pointing fingers, we've got to look forward because these very same institutions are the ones that will lead us out of this crisis. So it's not going to do a lot of good looking back. We've made a lot of mistakes, and we know that. But we can do something about it. Agricultural research is another key issue. Of, of all the policy responses to alleviate global hunger, no set of interventions holds more promise than agricultural research, and yet it's severely underfunded. In fact, today, Secretary of State's science advisor says it's 1 to 2 percent of biomedical research. And this is paradoxical because what we have in agricultural research are those things that take the pressure off the medical research budget. Look at the USDA's agricultural research priorities. Global food security, <coughs> bioenergy, climate change, nutrition, obesity, food safety. If we can get a handle on those, we don't need as much biomedical research. Part of the problem, we haven't put a human face on it. You know, we talk about science a lot, but we don't talk about what science does for people a lot. You've heard about golden rice for years, you know, adding beta carotene to rice. And you read all these reports about golden rice, and it's about, you know, some great new genetic conquest. Isn't science wonderful? That's not the message. The message is this has the promise to alleviate the agony of vitamin A deficiency in the over 600,000 children who die a year from things like night blindness and river blindness. We've got to tell the story. Whether it's a, it's a distressed farmer in Lee County or a starving child in Sudan, if we're going to talk about agricultural science and we're going to get funding for it, and our delegations have done a lot of good work on this for decades, but it's still relatively very low because it doesn't move people. They don't understand the good that it does in transforming people. 
Related to that is post-harvest loss. Uh, that may not strike you as an exciting subject. It is a critical issue. We lose, we know here we lose 15, 20, 25 percent of our own food, usually plate waste or deterioration. Overseas they lose 40, 50, 80. Just a few numbers from the Global Cold Chain Alliance on how important this issue is. India. India is a country, there are 195 countries. Six, seven countries have two-thirds of all the hunger and poverty in the world. India has 25 percent, one country, 75 million children, one country. Every 10 tomatoes harvested, pulled from the vine, only six reach the child. Think what that would mean if we could deal with all of the issues on post-harvest loss, on transportation, refrigeration, knowledge about harvesting, markets, all the rest of it. It is a critical issue and in our horticultural research, ag science, we spend 95% on production. We spend 5% on post-harvest loss. 40% of eggplants in Ghana, gone. 70% of mangoes in Benin. Rwanda, 80% of bananas. 10 bananas are harvested, two reach the child. What's wrong with that picture? It's a critical issue. Just a couple more. The role of the private sector. And we look at everyone who can help in this equation on global food security. Who's most conspicuously missing? Private sector. It's the last frontier. Just think what companies can do if the UN would engage them more, if NGOs would engage them more. And there's some good work going on. But what could, what could Walmart teach India about inventory controls? What could uh, Ethiopia, FedEx, teach Ethiopia about food logistics? What about Coca-Cola teach Guatemala about water safety and quality? Sustainability. You know, sustainability was a wonderful term for a hundred years. It was just a benign term. Prosperous farmer, happy family, you know, great crops and markets. Had three essential components, an economic, a social, and an environmental. And they can't be separated. And the, the UN definition essentially is that we meet the needs of the present while taking care of the needs of the future. You know, leave it as you found it or leave it better. And yet today, there is no more, there's no term more charged with divisive rhetoric than sustainability. Because the ag stakeholders don't know who's going to win and who's going to lose. They don't know what it means. They don't know who's going to be hurt. Marty Matlock at the Center for Ag Sustainability says everything's connected. We're all in this together. And the unintended consequences are daunting. We have to know where we're going to come out on this. Let me give you some, just some quick examples on how complex this issue of sustainability is. Ethiopian coffee. Some well-intended activists decided they are going to boycott Ethiopian coffee because the water used to make the coffee is probably draining aquifers and hurting the environment in Ethiopia. So they did it. <clears throat> Coffee sales dropped in Kroger and Starbucks, Whole Foods and everywhere else. The scientists got involved and they concluded that the water for Ethiopian coffee essentially is rainwater, it's green water. So it's soil moisture, doing nothing for the aquifers. But meanwhile, because of this misperception, lots of small subsistent farmers taking care of their families went out of business. Sustainability. Another item, biofuels. Biofuels. We rushed into it, great idea. Take the pressure off Middle East oil, wonderful idea. But we didn't take into account what it meant to the food supply and we didn't consider what it would mean to the environment if they started burning off literally millions of acres of trees in Indonesia and the Brazilian rainforest. 
sustainability. Third example, genetically modified white maize, corn. There's some people now protesting at Gates because Gates is investing substantially in white maize with Monsanto and with the CG Center in Mexico and with an African foundation. Um, why? Because they're, they're producing a product that when it gets in the field is expected to give yields 30% higher than normal, even in drought conditions. Stunning food, in, food security implications, and yet the protests are going on. Sustainability. Finally, locally grown. We're big fans of locally grown. But let me just leave you this to ponder. What if everyone insisted on locally grown? What if nobody, we can't do it in production agriculture, but what if everybody really made locally grown, that's it? What would that mean for Bradley Pinks? What would that mean for Arkansas's catfish industry? Just this sustainability issue is, is a tough one. I'll wrap it up with, let me just share something that's bothered me for a long time. It's this notion that why don't we just teach them to fish? Why are we giving them fish? I mean, isn't that just creating dependency? That's not helping anybody. Why do we give them fish? In an ideal world, there would be only development. We've had a glorious history of it with the Marshall Plan, the Peace Corps, work our food foreign scholarships. Jim Morris, who's formerly head of the UN, said we have now have 25, in the last 30 years we have quadrupled the natural disasters in this world. So just as it's our priority here to deal with emergencies first, as we do, that is also the U.S. philosophy overseas. So if it's, if it's a famine in North Korea, if it's a hurricane in Haiti, if it's a drought in Ethiopia, if it's a war in Kosovo, if children are at risk, we're going to be there if we can. That's, those are our values. Tocqueville, Tocqueville came here in 1830, about 180 years ago, and he studied us like a bug in a jar. He went back to France and he wrote about us in this epic, Democracy in America. And one of the things he said was, he said, those people, those Americans are really strange people. They do things like going to their neighbors' houses and knocking on doors and saying things like, can I help you? Are you hungry? Do you need anything to eat? And apparently they don't want anything in return. It's just the way they are. I think if Tocqueville would come here today, he would carefully record Governor Beebe's words, no child, senior citizen, man or woman deserves to go without food. All right, I'm, I'm going to close now, and I'd like to, uh, I've talked a lot about global issues. I'd like to talk directly to the Clinton School students about our challenge at home, about remembering what sets you apart from other presidential schools. The other presidential schools, as we know, are they're schools of government, public affairs. They're, they train their graduates to manage the world. You're different. You're trained to change the world. It is an awesome responsibility. Anywhere you go to end hunger is a wonderful thing to be applauded. And no doubt you'll go far places. And I want to encourage you to spend some of your energy here at home because just as this place and these people have contributed so much to global food security. We need you now here too. After all, Mother Teresa's own words were, just do the thing that's in front of you. In many, <clears throat> many essential respects, our, the narrative history of this country has been about a race. It's a race in which our political will has tried to catch up with our core values. And by core values, I mean what are we willing to fight for and how do we want to be remembered in the long sweep of history? 
Change always comes in the moment of realization when what we have been willing to accept does not match what we know to be right. That's when we bend the arc of America's history. Women will remember just 90 years ago, you were not trusted with a vote. 50 years after the Civil War Amendment. And we finally said, that's not who we are. We changed it. 70 years ago, we allowed 11-year-old girls to work 70 hours a week with bleeding hands in textile factories, no heat, no health insurance, and we finally said enough. Unimaginable as it is now, the color of your skin wants to determine which building you went to school in. We said no. And it, just two issues, two issues related to, to this theme. You know, back in the 1930s, somebody had this idea <clears throat> we're going to print stamps, we're going to get your tax dollars and print stamps and give those stamps to poor and hungry people for food. Everybody said, that's a nutty idea. Not with my tax dollars, you're not going to do that. Seventy years ago, the food stamp program is now one of the most accepted programs in America. In its proof, of Roosevelt's words that the test of our progress is not whether we have added to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those who have too little. The other example is the school lunch program. We once allowed our children, particularly if they were poor, minority, to sit in school all day listless and emaciated, nothing to eat. That was 219 million school meals ago. 31 million beneficiaries today. In a deeper sense, what that said was, this is how we want to be remembered in history. Child nutrition is paramount. So th these are just down payments. Students today know you can bend that arc of history. You can end it once and for all, and your children 40 years from now can look back at you and say, yes, they did it. They did it. Their political will caught up with their core values. And you couldn't have a more inspiring challenge than right here, the words of Anne Frank, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Thank you, and God bless you. God speed. We do have time for a couple questions. If you raise your hand, we'll uh, get a microphone to you right in the middle. Sue? One second, just wait for the microphone. I would like Hold on one second. I would like to say that Arkansas is like a library. We have the genetics. When you mentioned all of those names of our leaders and our helpers, we have the core of what we need in Arkansas to show the country how to solve this problem. And you know, just this week, uh, there's a group of scientists going to Washington to talk about Alzheimer's disease. Why isn't there a group of us, why isn't there an Arkansas big parade in Washington to say, we want to feed these children, period. We want to empower women, and we're going to do it in Arkansas, because we know how, and we have the organizations to help us do it. Here, here. Are there any questions? Yeah, here you go, Bob. Just listening to what you've said, can we solve the food problem, the hunger in the world without controlling population? Without? Controlling the growth of population in the world. Aren't they hand in hand? Well, I think that's what the challenge is, and the scientific community would say that's what we're working on with new technologies. Bill Gates says this, uh, this notion that we should have sustainability versus productivity is a false choice. We've got to have both. And a lot of the work going on now in 
for example, climate change mitigation is to come up with new crops that can deal with hotter temperatures in the saline tolerant rice and coal tolerant rice and higher nutritional values in other foods and uh, greater beta carotene in potatoes and uh, uh, drought tolerant corn. So uh, scientists are working on a lot of new technologies. We need to also be working on the issue of post harvest laws if we're going to keep the population up. We need to work on empowerment of women. We need to work on quality of governments. Again, that's, that's numero uno. That's, that's the main thing. Um, I think the scientific community and a lot of people working in hunger today, and I'm, I'm you know, here with Jill Locke, I mean, there's, a, there's an old joke, the punchline of which is never talk about water, and never talk about floods if Noah is in the audience. So I don't know why I'm answering this, this question instead of Joe Luck. But I think people are confident that we have the commitment and the technology to do it, but there are better ways, there are better ways to do it. And if we're smarter about what we, with the different tools we have on diplomacy and um, the policies, I think we can. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Sophia Said. I'm a Clinton School student. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for your insightful remarks. You spoke about governance in relationship with food in, uh, distribution in your uh, speech, and which made me think about uh, Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate, who wrote extensively about food distribution, hunger, famine, and governance. I'm really curious to know what do you think about his unique approach and what, if you would like to comment on that. Um, Atramara Sen was one of the great figures in, in global food security and he famously said, there has never been a famine in history without a functioning, where there was a functioning democracy. Um, point being, uh, 1846 in Ireland, there was a lot of food, a lot of beef, a lot of dairy, a lot of grain, but you have to have, if you have a famine, you have to have two events. You have to have a, an extraordinary environmental event. You also have to have a government that is either unresponsive or incapable of responding. In 1846 in Ireland, the British government was unwilling to respond. The Irish government was incapable of responding. In 1984, a million people, by the time a million people had died in Ethiopia, one of the reasons uh, the famine was there is that governments, the Derg was in power, and most of the OECD countries said, we're not going to respond. We're just going to let them collapse of their own weight. They had a similar drought in Ethiopia some 20 years later, and there was a massive response by the United Nations, by NGOs, by governments, and virtually no loss. So th these factors are all tied in with each other, and uh, Dr. Sen had a very, I would encourage you to read Atamara Sen. He's one of the finest, finest scholars on the subject. Okay. Welcome home. Thank you. I'm Phyllis Haynes. I'm with the Arkansas Food Bank Network. Great. Uh, several years ago, a gentleman from Chicago uh, spearheaded the creation of the Global Food Bank Network fellow named Robert Forney. I'm wondering if that food bank network is even a blip on the world radar screen, if you know anything about it and what they're doing. It, it is, and Bob is one of the, one of the founding members. Uh, it's a very important force, and he was one of the founding members of the Alliance to End Hunger. Uh, Joe Luck is an active member of the Alliance to End Hunger, and yes, Food bank networks do a lot of wonderful good, and, and Bob Forney is, is, I was at a meeting with him not long ago. They're still very active, and it's a, quite a good example that he sets. Hmm? Yeah. Right in the middle, right there, yeah. 
Thank you. My name is Nadia Safar. I'm a student at Pulaski Academy. My question is, do you believe that the sustainable development of megacities will help eradicate um, world hunger and help secure food supplies, and how will it affect the American economy and the economy of other industrialized nations around the world? Sustainable development, what? Of megacities. I didn't get that. Megacities? I think they're, um, yes, I do. <laughs> but, but again, this gets back to the question of how complex this issue is and, and how many different institutions are involved and how much goodwill is needed. And what we have to have more than anything is a greater understanding of the root causes and how to deal with those causes. And the more that's understood, I think you're going to see more people relieved. So I do, I do, I am optimistic about that. And, and I, I think, again, just, We've got to put a human face on this. Too often the issues we talk about do not have a human face. And these are always about people. And they're about people who are suffering. And they're about people who can be helped. And no matter where you come from, no matter what your philosophy is, your sense of personal security, your belief system, your politics, it doesn't matter. You have a reason to be very actively engaged in this issue. Thank you. I think that Noah wanted to talk about floods for a second. <laughs> right behind you. Right. Huh? Okay. No, right behind you. I, I the floor. <laughs> no, no, no. No, you've been very gracious and very generous with your remarks, and, and I'm deeply touched. Thank you. Um, but if I could stand at the podium next month and deliver the words that you just have in such a manner, I would be greatly, greatly honored Ed, to be able to do that. So I'm going to ask permission to quote you. I think, David, you have really done a wonderful job and hit on so many, many important things in a short time in a succinct manner that uh, is really inspiring. So we're glad you're God here. God bless Thank you. you. I, let, me, let me just say that, you know, Bill, Bill Clinton reminded us when he was here two weeks ago that there's been an explosion of NGOs. That there are thousands of NGOs doing good work in health and hunger and child nutrition and all the rest. There are literally hundreds of global NGOs. The World Food Prize Committee that Norman Borlaug started, when they sit down to pick, they're looking at 195 countries and they're looking at hundreds of NGOs. And the fact that they have chosen Joe Luck and David Beckman is a very wonderful and significant thing. Thank you. We have time for one more, right there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am a student at the Clinton School, Great. and I am from Kenya, and so. I just kind of had this epiphany within the last seven days, and you really helped kind of um, explain that. How would um, interventions, so say we're just happy and excited um, in a lot of the developing countries just to get the children into schools and just to get the girls into schools, but how do we translate that into the reality um, in terms of how the education system in Kenya was, it was just theory, and we didn't actually get to see half a project. So we didn't get to see what's going on around us. And right. so how would you tap those children and high school education system so that while they're in school, whatever they're making sense of it coming out, they will be interested in agriculture, our research in the continent instead of exporting all this knowledge into the, into the nations. A couple of points. First, I, 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 I was not long ago with uh, Namanga Nagangi, who's president of the uh, Alliance to End Hunger, uh, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa in Nairobi. They're doing great work there, largely with the Gates Foundation grant. I, I think on the on the issue, and it relates in part to the empowerment of girls. You should know that it informs U.S. policy and also the executive board of the World Food Program in Rome that if countries, and all of these policies must be country-led, and that's, that's the essence of Feed the Future. Secretary Clinton, Secretary Vilsack, we acknowledged 
you've got to get buy-in from the countries. Millennium Challenge Corporation, that's the philosophy of that. And what informs that board is if countries are not willing to give that empowerment and that opportunity to young girls, they do not get the resources of the United Nations. And the U.S. is very solidly behind that. Once you get the, if you have countries that don't buy into that, like Zimbabwe or North Korea, there's not a lot we can do in the short term. But if countries are willing to buy in and understand what the benefits will be to girls and, uh, and what that will mean to their standard of living and to their economy and to their job creation, then it sells itself. So I think we all have a responsibility to do that. A lot of that is going on this week with the Clinton Global Initiative and with the, uh, the UN General Assembly. Because when you get to the Millennium Development Goals, all the Millennium Development Goals, it's about girls, maternal health, it's about AIDS, it's about hunger and poverty, it's about the environment, it's about education. All of these issues are tied together. They cannot be separated. Girls are in the middle of all this. And we have to use our good influence as governments to try to get countries to buy into these, to understand that it is in their best interest short term and long term. It's in their trade interest, it's in their economic interest, and it's in the interest of their soul. Thank you.